okay so we were discussing about uh partaking in the sufferings of christ and we said that we must have a positive attitude the only person who can have a positive attitude in a difficult time is somebody who believes in um, uh you know the the work of jesus and eternal life in christ jesus where we understand oh there is so much glory you know on the other side that what i'm going through right now it's not think compared to what i am going to experience uh you know in the glory of god so that's why he calls the believer and he says um remember he said so jonas pilgrims temporary you're all here temporarily uh rejoice you know mm, uh, exceeding joy be glad with exceeding ex and exceedingly exceeding joy glad with exceeding joy he says okay so it's beautiful in fact uh, if you read of some of the accounts of people who have been through persecution um, uh, it's surprising that uh, one of the common things that you notice among the persecutors is that they wonder why uh, these believers are so bold so joyful you know so strong uh, and the reason is this the reason is that losing in this life as you understand losing is not losing because there is so much more in eternity that has been kept for us as a reward that no loss is really a loss here um, as long as you know we walk righteously with the lord and suffer for the right things now he comes back to explaining about jesus and jesus's attitude in verse 14 he says if you are reproach for the name of christ or if you are persecuted you know for the name of christ blessed are you okay so blessed are we when we go through you know it's it's like if if somebody says oh you oh you are a, a, a believer you believe in jesus okay you know i'm not talking to you or something like that in one way we are happy that i could have a testimony that i am following jesus and that is why i am being ill treated the bible says blessed are you okay blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of god rests upon you okay what an encouragement what an encouragement you know nothing when we are going through uh, good times calm easy times we can praise god when we are doing the right thing and going through hard times we can still praise god because god is saying you know his spirit of glory is resting on us uh, he rests on us what a privilege we are such a blessed people in whether it is easy or difficult then uh we are told that when people you know speak ill of us it says on their part he is blasphemed but on your part he is glorified you know christ is actually being glorified because of what i am going through they think that they were they are you know doing a great job of putting down jesus putting down the followers of jesus but no actually the lord jesus is being glorified through us but he reminds the believers again see i'm not saying all this that we go through suffering for doing the wrong things if we go through suffering for the wrong things sorry none of the supplies to us okay. so i i think i gave some examples last time isn't it that sometimes as believers we'll just do um uh you know activities so foolishly and then get into trouble for that right uh, and then we say oh i am being persecuted but that's not what it is referring to so even when we are doing ministry i think i shared this be very careful you know what are the um, laws of the land which i have to uphold mm, i should be very sensitive you know to uh, the needs of the people around how am i doing what i am doing how is my testimony before the people these are all su such important things for us as um, people serving the lord and especially if we are in leadership you know we have to be all the more sensitive because for us it might be a small thing you know what we say what we do how we behave but it really impacts other people 
okay so be very careful be very sensitive do the right thing when we do the right thing then yes god is on our side his glory will be seen through our uh, suffering so he in fact he puts it very bluntly he says but let none of you suffer as murderer a thief an evil doer a busy body in other people's matters you know busy body is somebody who is um, you know just uh, wasting their time and uh, so called doing a lot of work but there's really no outcome from that work no and also busy body refers to uh, somebody who is interfering in people's affairs you know uh, talking gossip slander those kind of things just interfering in people's affairs and assuming that oh i'm so busy i'm doing some work but it's not at all the kind of work that god wants so he he basically says please don't do all these things and then expect god to uh, bless your suffering now he says yet if anyone suffers as a christian so you can simply understand that as for the right reasons for the sake of jesus like you know you had a daniel he said no um you know they said don't pray don't uh, uh, pray for the three times you don't look at the temple instead you bow down to the king he says no i can't do that so for god standards godly standards he was persecuted again chadrak mesha ke nabad ne go they wanted to go and uh, i mean they were asked to bow down to the idol of the emperor at that time they said sorry we can't do that okay so excuse me for godly reasons or here it says now for us on the other side of the cross as believers in jesus or christians when we are persecuted don't be ashamed but let him let we glorify god okay, in this matter also so what a privilege so again he is reminding for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of god so you see god earlier we saw that right god judges the living and the dead so we see in scripture that god is enthroned you know righteousness and justice are the foundations of god's throne so he is a god who will uh, judge correctly so living meaning even in this lifetime you know, we can experience um, uh, god's righteous judgment you know, sometimes we feel oh it happened wrongfully some things have been done to me how is it that you know i i can continue to serve god when god is not intervening in my situation no let's not think like that because even in this lifetime we are promised god's justice in various ways but in addition to that we know very well that after people die whether they are believers or they are unbelievers they will also come under god's judgment and here he warns the people of god he says look judgment begin at the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of god so see god is very um, you know he's a holy god and i know there is a course also on holiness he's a holy god so his house has to be a holy house we cannot allow sin or any kind of uh, you know uh, spots that sin brings to taint or discolor the the holy nature of the body of christ so he is warning the believers and he saying see in your fellowship in your fellowship live holy because god is going to judge and god is such a person that even his own people he judges he will not be unfair he will not be unfair so it will begin at the house of god and if it begins with us first so that means nobody is going to escape the judgment of god you know for a believer we just assume oh the world is going to be judged people who are opposing jesus are going to be judged i am safe no he is in fact saying god is so just he will judge everyone the believer as well as the 
unbeliever but he talks about the fact that you know when the others when the unbeliever is judged it is so scary because those who do not uh, if god is fair with the believer the unbeliever is not under the protection of christ salvation so it's really scary you know what kind of judgment the unbeliever would come under so he just says you know if uh, it begins with us first what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of god okay so then you know he just continues to remind and encourage the believers that okay come on we need to obey believers we need to obey we need to uh, also proclaim this message so that many can come to obedience in christ jesus yeah so the re rest of the uh, verses there mean the same thing that i was sharing earlier okay so again he encourages encourages and he says therefore let those who suffer according to the will of god so you see again this is also another thing you know in terms of theology people say so you know in the bible it says suffering according to the will of god and they use this to say that sickness disease yes you are suffering according to the will of god so it's okay go through that sickness but you know we must interpret it in its context so in this passage of first peter chapter 4 we are learning about persecution for righteous actions okay that is very clear that if that happens then we are partaking of the sufferings of christ if that happens then we are suffering in the will of god so we should not put other meanings into suffering according to the will of god and you know he says uh, if at all one is going through this sort of persecution commit their souls commit their souls is you know we entrust right we we hand over something to uh, uh, people we trust so let's say mm, you know i am traveling and i have this very precious equipment in my house and i'm scared oh when i'm traveling what if there is a, a break in and someone takes it away so i might give it to a trusted friend who stays close by and say can you please keep this when i come back i will take it from you so what have i done it's like an accounting term you commit it you give it into safe keeping so that you can take it later so in the same way uh, what peter is saying is see when we are going through suffering it's very challenging like even in our soul man soulish realm it's so difficult so many questions pain hurt but you know trust in god is what he's saying you just commit everything to god commit yourself to god because god is faithful you know he will return uh, that peace joy whatever you committed to him he will give it back in a good way to you and he says as to a faithful creator so god is so faithful he has created us uh, he will not forsake us so moving right along we go to first uh, peter chapter 5 now again more instructions are there um, for uh, the fellowship the believers fellowship so he says over here there are uh, elders and he brings an encouragement to these elders uh, he says i who am a fellow elder so what is an elder you know elder uh, as we understand in the new testament usage of the term is people who are um, providing some sort of an example some sort of a leadership to the uh, congregation okay so that would be an elder so in other words we can also say that an elder is a, a more mature believer so uh, does it mean that an elder is only somebody who is older in age not necessarily because you remember timothy uh, when paul writes to timothy he says don't let anybody you know uh, put you down because you are young no so age is not the main criteria over here but it is possible that many elders could have been 
older in age also so he is telling the elders of the church that uh you know uh basically he's encouraging them in the time of persecution and he says um, god's glory will be revealed through it all and he moves on to say shepherd the flock of god what is shepherd shepherd is if you again look up the meaning there it is like tend nurture so the way a shepherd cares for the sheep uh, but you see the caring should lead to growth understood so we care so that there is maturity so in that way shepherd the flock of god flock of god uh, it's not you know animal sheep but god's people who are the ones that we are leading uh, who are among you serving as overseers overseers is uh, looking after the affairs of the church or the congregation and now he also shares some leadership lessons here he says how to lead these people you know obviously when we are uh, leading people into maturity it may not always be easy you know sometimes it's easy we can be uh, friendly joking around all that it works but sometimes when we notice that uh, people's lives are not in line with the standards of god's holiness you know we have to bring correction we have to bring instructions and that's not easy because people may not like it you know? or there can be conflict time of co uh, some situation of conflict between peoples in the members in the church itself so you know, all these are mm, difficult circumstances but he says in the midst of all these things do it willingly okay not by compulsion shouldn't feel a leader shouldn't uh, have an attitude where you say or oh, you like you know i have to do this god it's not i mean it's, it's taking up too much of my energy why should i go and correct why should i instruct you know, so when we have that sort of an attitude he says it's not nice for an elder or a leader but what attitude is required willingly where we are excited we are uh, looking for a, a way to help the church grow so everything that we notice you know we take it as hey okay nice i can i can uh, encourage you know this brother because he has uh, led worship very well or you would say oh this brother he he is mm, he doesn't understand how to use finances okay let me see how is it that i can uh, bring some correction in this thing so you're basically excited and you're thinking of good ways in which you can minister to the people because when we do that no willingly ultimately a good leader or a shepherd is the one you want everyone to mature you want a thriving church with strong believers who know the word who live the word right who serve one another so basically we are very excited and we have a vision okay so he is asking for that kind of an attitude so if at all leaders have uh, um you know a way of leading where they struggle and drag and pull that's not godly at all okay and we really need to um sometimes i can understand it happens to all normal uh, leaders that you know we may feel sad uh, because of uh, the difficulties but then uh, in general there's an attitude of willingness where we are so happy to lead god's people then he also adds you know an elder should not do god's work for dishonest gain sometimes there is that tendency right so oh if i am if i am a chai if i am a leader or some if i am an elder then people will you know trust me or i can get some resources from people or some financial help because people trust you know anyone who is in a position of leadership so if a uh, an overseer has a sinful way of thinking you know, they will try to take advantage of the believers but that is so wrong that is what peter is saying that as an overseer one should serve willingly and not for dishonest gain but eagerly 
okay and one more thing he adds here he adds he says nor being lords over who those entrusted to you so always remember we must always remember those entrusted to us so going back to the example which i said you know if i have a very expensive equipment in my house and i give it to my friend okay or uh, let me put it this way uh, there is a diamond necklace okay which i have and i give it to my friend and then say hey i'm traveling i will be back and i will pick it up from you how do you think i will feel if i um, you know find out from somebody that my friend is uh, you know wearing my uh, diamond necklace everywhere okay so when i come back also i notice that you know she is using it i will be like hey it was entrusted to you it was given to you for safe keeping but what are you doing with it because it belongs to me it does not belong to her so it was only given for a period of time so in the same way when we look at god's people you know those those of us who are in leadership we must recognize that we are there to serve and these people whom we serve we have been entrusted with these people or in other words god has given these people to us and that is why you know peter says don't lord over them you know lord over is like in our uh, regular english these days we say bossing over okay so that's what he is saying he is saying as leaders we can't boss over people you know make them do this for us oh you do that you do this because then we are we are treating them as if you know we bought them but who purchased these people with his blood jesus and jesus has entrusted these people to us so you know when we when this settles in our minds whenever we are serving people yes you know these are uh, god's people you look at them as god's people okay i have 30 people in my church god has given me 30 people god has given me 50 people god has given me 2000 people whose people are these god's people and so we serve them with that attitude of reverence because he is going to ask us what did you do okay how did you nurture how did you bring about maturity in the lives of these people so we are in other words we are accountable when we are entrusted we cannot take it lightly so it's all leadership okay just in like two three lines he says um so much we understood no shepherd meaning tend nurture overseer or uh, you 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 have oversight you take care of all the affairs of the church then he says what attitude willingly eagerly what attitude we should not carry doing it out of compulsion or for dishonest gain you know those things we must uh, avoid and then he says we must not lord over god's people but now he adds another point and that point is he says be examples to the flock so this is the biggest lesson of leadership and i think you all have done a course on uh, leadership as well so being examples you know it boils down to that leaders are good examples we can look at their life we can follow their life example and that will help us you know mature more in god so that is the way in which you know he wants the elders of the church to lead the church now again notice you know paul peter these were all apostolic apost or, or you know they were all apostles isn't it what was the responsibility of apostles we have studied that in apostolic ministry they would appoint churches okay and they would ensure the uh, strengthening of churches they would uh, look into appointing the right leaders for the churches okay they would instruct the churches to um, uh, have right standards when it comes to worship when it comes to you know doing uh, doing church and the affairs of everyday life so don't you think you know in these epistles that's how peter is writing to the believers he's giving them instructions he is appoint you know he is not 
appointing leaders but he has a word of exhortation for the elders he is telling them how to lead so the standards for leadership are being clarified so uh, all these these are the functions of an apostle which peter is fulfilling now moving on to verse 4 here he reminds the elders when the chief shepherd appears so remember entrusted the people that god has entrusted to us who are we accountable to the chief shepherd or jesus is called as the main shepherd the leading shepherd whom we have to answer but if we have led the people well then we can be happy because he says that the chief shepherd will give a crown of glory which does not fade away so eternal rewards see even in first peter chapter 1 he talked about eternity eternal reward inheritance you know so there is always the reality of eternity for a believer and it's so glorious and exciting that much is waiting for us you know in eternity so he also reminds you you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away and the rewards in heaven one feature of those rewards are that they cannot be destroyed here in the world you have your uh, you know moth and weather and so many things can destroy you know earthly uh, material but in heaven what we possess will be so durable and so because of all these things he is just encouraging the believers so moving forward more instructions uh, verse 5 onwards he says likewise you younger people who are the younger people i just said elders does not mean older okay they could be older but they could also be young in terms of the age so you younger people if you look at the translation there okay <laughs> excuse me just give me a moment class yeah coming back to what we were saying here younger people uh the greek word means new okay so new is quite obvious new in the lord growing in the lord you know babe in christ all these terms are used so younger people refers to those who are new in the faith so that is the way we look at it so he tells such people to submit to the more mature people in the church so submit yourself to the elders now you could also take it uh, in a, a literal way to say that those of us who are younger in our age we should uh, submit ourselves or you know be subject to older people that's fine because we are called to honor okay the older older people so that's okay that is also fine so ultimately he says yes all of you be submissive to one another so you see whenever we talk about submission in the bible generally we notice this even even paul when he wrote to the husbands and the wives okay um in ephesians ephesians chapter 5 yeah ephesians chapter 5 so there he he talks about the husband and wife relationship also and then he reminds the wife submit to your husband but later on he goes on to say both of you husband and wife submit one to another in the same way you know peter here is saying he says you know elders um, uh, younger ones submit to the elders but he also says submit one to another is be submissive to one another and he says be clothed with 
humility being clothed with humility i'll just tell you what exactly it means yeah so uh being clothed was a term which they used when a slave would put on an apron and be ready to serve the master so it's like having a ready attitude a very ready attitude um to service right? so that is the way we look at it so he's saying being ready to serve being subject to elders more mature people in the church uh and you know he says when we're ready to serve we also need a quality what is that humility we must walk with humility so this is all very important in the uh, fellowship of believers so we must never miss out on the attitude of submission and also the attitude of humility now he adds to that and he says god resists the proud so the way this has been written uh apparently it means that god actively goes against the proud person so we can imagine you know that uh, uh you know we when somebody is going to attack a certain person okay let's say war there's war going on and uh, uh, one party wants to attack the other party they will actively uh, put on their armor they will get their weapons they will you know oil their weapons they will prep everything because now they are going to attack the enemy so when we read this god resists the proud it is it gives us the understanding that god actively goes against those who have a proud heart Okay, and so that's very scary. You know, we don't want to be uh, on the opposite team of God. Okay, so how can I be uh, very close to God and on God's team? Walk with humility. So if we want God on our side, God will be on our side when we are humble. Okay, so humility is so important. It says, God resists the proud. but what does he do for the humble one is we can be on god's team if we are humble second is gives grace to the humble you know grace has many meanings in the new testament just a moment i'll uh, tell you what the meaning is over here yeah the exact word is so grace over here is charis okay charis and charis means graciousness or god being gracious towards us or there are other words also uh, which uh, which say um, favor so we could look at it that way you know god being gracious to us and god extending favor on our behalf so if i want that to happen i need to be a humble person and also you know some someone who is humble we would see them walking in more and more you know a uh, favor of god more and more grace of god and uh, how is it happening because that person is following this principle in god's word being submissive being humble then what happens you know god himself will uh, work on behalf of that person so because of this that's why he says therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of god how to humble till now in uh, various interactions he has already taught the people he said submit 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 for the sake of god you know submit so us doing the right thing okay is very important that is one way in which we just humble ourselves yeah we want to uh, 
revolt and fight back and remember he shares about the example of Jesus how Jesus did not do that he did not go and fight back instead you know, he was patient uh, because he was fulfilling the purpose of god through what he went through on the cross so in the same way humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of god is going through suffering unjustly because our faith is in god you know we have entrusted we have committed remember commit your souls to god because he is a faithful creator so because of my faith and my trust i am willing to fix my eyes on jesus and go through challenges with a good attitude that is humbling ourselves in god's sight so when we humble ourselves what happens you know uh, we we see that uh, humility brings exaltation okay and god is somebody who lifts up the humble but the proud what does he do he brings them down if you recall i think it's the story of esther where you have uh, haman he he makes this whole gallows for a uh, a uh, uh, jewish man called mordecai to be killed on and he's so happy he's so proud he's ready he's waiting when is this going to happen i better just destroy this man uh, mordecai but you see god took over when the people prayed what happened you know god did something unusual suddenly you know, the king could not sleep that night and we are told he was going through the records and then he found the name of one man who had protected him uh, by you know giving information so he asks the people okay who is this person i need to reward i've still not rewarded this person and it turns out that it is modekai okay so you see how the way god works what did he do he humbled that haman person who was very proud he wanted to take all the glory but god is working above what people are working on so you find you find that god humbled haman but god exalted modekai so exaltation is in god's hands and we are told very clearly here that if we choose to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of god or in other words by trusting god and doing the right thing then what can we expect he will exalt okay uh, uh how is he going to exalt you know we we don't exactly know in which way you know god will uh, give us that justice but we trust him we say okay god you know best and you will do it for us also it says in due time which means that to experience god's intervention it might take some time so we should not get discouraged and so he says casting all your care upon him again it's an invitation to trust god you know casting uh, that word means to throw to throw so it's amazing peter is saying don't carry your worries your fears and uh, you know all that heaviness that comes from not trusting god if there are burdens he just says casting your care upon the lord or just take everything and throw it on god it's like saying okay god i am going to trust you completely and he reminds the people you know he reminds them and he says that he cares for you or god cares for you so in that times these are the gentiles that god is uh, peter is uh, talking to apparently you know in that culture they knew about a god who um, will come and you know uh, interact with mankind and all but they never had the idea of a god who cares and so peter is helping the believers know that you see this we say right sometimes we use the term god is in control god is in charge in some ways that's what he's saying he's saying you do the right thing because ultimately the final judgment decision everything is upon god he will do what is right so don't worry about it okay uh, so in other words 
trust God for who he is and what he can do. He also emphasizes that we have a caring God, a caring God, which probably would have been so new for these believers. They never thought, oh, how can God be caring towards us? But that's the fact here. He says, the reason I'm telling you trust God wholeheartedly is because God cares for you. Okay? Then he also, while he is telling them about God, he's also warning them about the devil. So very familiar uh, passage here where he says, be sober. Again, sober is uh, being clear-minded. Okay? Clear-minded. Be sober, be vigilant or be alert. Because your adversary or your enemy, the devil, Satan, you know, we call them Satan, walks about like a roaring lion. To do what? Seeking whom he may devour. So he's uh, telling the people about the reality of God's deliverance at the same time the reality of an enemy who's waiting to attack. So he says, he is ready. Okay, he's just ready to pounce on the believer. But he says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So in other words, he says, you know, be strong in the faith uh, and also realize that anyone who is in Christ Jesus is bound to go through difficulties because there is an enemy who is waiting to attack the believers. And so what should we do? A uh, couple of things here. Be sober, be vigilant, or in other words, be alert, be watchful, and then resist, resist or go against the works of the devil. And then he goes on to uh, blessing the believers. Uh, but he says, may the great God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, notice that, throughout there is an eternal perspective. He says, suffered a while. So in the world, whatever suffering we are going through for Christ, it is temporary. And so he says, after we have gone through it, God is going to perfect, establish, strengthen and settle you. Or in other words, it's like saying, you know, if there is a, uh, uh, there is a tree, it is shaking. It's not firm in the soil. What does the gardener do? He'll generally they'll take another uh, stick or something. You know, they will uh, uh, give some reinforcement. They will give some support, and then they will continue to water it and do other things that are needed till the roots become strong, till that tree is able to stand firm. So in the same way, he's saying that you know God, the way He works in our lives is He will strengthen us. He will give us good, strong foundations uh, and, uh, you know, he will make us um, firm in himself. So we put our trust in God, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So this is generally a way of closing off a, a letter. So he's giving glory to God. And then, you know, he uh, also explains how he wrote this letter. If you uh, recall, you know, Paul is the scholarly person. Peter is what? Fisherman. So how did Peter write this uh, epistle? And also you notice it, the way it comes through. It's somewhat simpler than the writings of Apostle Paul. So he explains, he says, by Sylvanus. Our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you. Or in other words, he says, he took a scribe or he must have dictated to Sil uh, Silas and said, Silas or Silvanus, okay, same person. So Silas is the one who wrote for Peter all these things. He wrote it down. So he explained it to the people. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So just some closing thoughts over here. I've written to you briefly, uh, exhorting, testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. In other words, he says, don't give up. There is eternity that you must keep your eyes on. So this, whatever you're going through, be strong in it. And then he also says, she who is in Babylon, 
elect together with you greets you so he brings a greeting from a she who is the she anyone want to take a guess she from babylon greets you okay no guesses okay no idea okay uh, yeah it's it's little difficult to put a female name to it but even the church is called the bride isn't it so it is likely that the she is church a church in babylon so the church in babylon greets you a set of believers who uh, accepted christ there and you know they would have been worshiping together so peter is referring to them and uh, so does mark my son you know mark is the same mark who we see in uh, uh, the book of acts it shows that you know the apostles were working with this mark also and he calls him as my son so there's a close relationship that peter shared with mark and he says greet one another with a kiss of love so th these are all ways of uh, expressing brotherly love in those times now it is different for us you know we shake hands we say hello we say praise the lord so it it, it is just a form of uh, greeting and he says peace to you all who are in christ jesus amen again it's their way of saying you know we generally don't say you know peace to you all or anything generally say bye okay bye everyone uh, meet you next class so uh, it's just a way that <clears throat> the believers in those times closed off their communication so all right uh, we can uh, close here we are through with first peter uh, of all the five chapters so we move on to uh, second peter in the next class i will do i'm thinking i will do jude after that because it's kind of related it will be quick also and then we are only left with james and we finish off with that so uh would like to request one of us to please pray as we close i'll try me okay yeah sure thomas thank you yeah Father, we thank you. We praise you, Daddy. We bless you. Thank you for this wonderful time. Thank you for your faithfulness, Daddy. We bless your holy name. Thank you for the teachings. Thank you for the uh, today's sermon, Lord. Thank you, Daddy. As whatever the burdens we cast upon you, and we believe you will take care, Lord. Thank you, Father. If anybody having any worries in this group, Lord, let them let them cast away their worries and anxiety upon you because the, such a loving father the father of compassion is caring for us we thank you father we praise you as we going forward father let your grace will take forward sustain us and enable us to do more things for your kingdom lord we thank you we praise you we love you father thank you for your mercy and goodness we thank you we praise you for a, such a wonderful time in jesus name we pray amen Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you, class. God bless you. Uh, please go through uh, Second Peter if possible. And then we will uh, take it up in the next class. So bye for now. Bye. God thank bless. You, thank you. Bye.